All right, welcome back on this uh, Monday, everybody. Canada's daytime sports talk show continues. He's been waiting a while. Let's go out now to TSN 1050 Toronto's Michael Landsberg. You heard all the topics, Michael. You know what we're talking about today. How are you, my friend? You know, I'm uh, I'm great. I wasn't waiting long, five minutes, listening to your show, uh, admiring the fact that uh, you have a whole bunch of sponsors, which I think is great, which is, you know, you were talking about the evolution of all of these things that are disappearing. And you know, one of the ways that people are going to have to survive is to do what you're doing, which is um, to go out and not only do your show, but to sell your show. Yeah, well, the the one thing I'm that's I'm, I'm struggling with said more off the top of the show. You missed that, but I keep hearing that sports isn't important, and I'm not even fighting it anymore. Our heroes are the doctors and the teachers and, and first responders. I get that. I'm just sitting here going, "Have I wasted my life working in sports?" You, you know, have I, I, done the same thing. Yeah. You've had a similar life, very similar. And so, who's saying what? And then I'll take great offense to it. Just uh, just give me a second to to build <laughs> well, my. Just, Maybe My you're not, indignation. Well, maybe you're not hearing it, but as people saying sports isn't important, Rod, sports is a luxury. We, we can live without sports. That's what I'm hearing on the street. People are saying it to me in social media, that kind of thing. And look, we're looking at no CFL potentially for two years now is what we you know in terms because of the pandemic. And people are saying we can live without the CFL. CFL teams are asking major companies for loans to pay their staff. And the companies are going, uh-uh, nope. That's what's scaring me. I, I mean, legitimately, it, it's frightening to those that make their living from the sports business. So there's a million ramifications um, from what you're saying. I mean, let, let, I mean, let's face it, sports has has always had a far greater role to play in guys, men and women, their lives like you and me, than it probably should. Right. The fact that that you can be so into a game that you you you're, you're you're just waiting to explode you're so pissed off if something happened to your team and the fact that you can celebrate so wildly like i i remember oh okay well not long ago when uh og ananobi hit that shot i mean we were my wife and my daughter and i watching together we were going insane and over what like explain how something could be that good or in the other case a devastating loss how something could be that bad so it, you know, it's somehow sport has found its way into our lives, into our heads, into our hearts, into our souls. And it carves out this place of massive importance when really you could never explain it to somebody of a different culture who didn't have sports. Right. Like, what would you say to them? <laughs> I know. And the thing is, you're talking about bringing families together and bringing people together. And really what the government's saying is for now, you can't come together. So that's cool. But in the in the offshoot of that is the teams are dying and the leagues are dying. That's all right. The government's not trying to kill sport. They're trying to save lives. You know, that's the whole thing. And I'll just a, an offshoot of that where your, yours and my lives have paralleled is as mental health advocates and helping people. That's an even it's far more noble than sports. But you know yourself, people don't really care. It's very hard to make a living in, right? They don't care about mental health, oftentimes until it's too late. And that's a, that's a discussion for the Recovery Hour, another show that I do. But I'm just sitting here, I'm struggling, Michael, going, what's important? I don't know the answer. <laughs> Well, you know, what you just said uh, about, about mental health, about they don't care about it's far more important than talking about sports. I mean, uh, for, first of all, I agreed with every word of that, every single word. I mean, when I'm out pitching sponsors, um, I my words are this. If you don't create your mental health message with some entertainment, no one is going to care. It's a loser because people don't necessarily want what's good for them. Oh, I'm going to tune in to that show that Landsberg's doing and spending, you know, um, a ton of his time on working his ass off. He's pouring his heart and soul into it. I'm going to tune in and hear him talk about the important things about mental health. Sure, there's a few people that would do that, but there's no massive audience out there. So we have to find a way to wrap it up into something that's entertaining. I actually have a theory. I call it the the um, the fortune cookie theory that if people put these little messages just on your desk or when you went into a Chinese restaurant onto the table, you wouldn't care, but it's wrapped up in a cookie. So the cookie makes it better. The cookie makes it intriguing. And that's what we have to do with mental health. We have to make it entertaining because otherwise 
nobody cares. And the other thing is, uh, like I know when, when I talk about mental health, I feel like I'm doing something that's way more important than anything I ever did. And I never knew until I started doing this that, hey, you know, I've got something to offer more than some smart ass opinion on uh, mental health or more than trying to pull guests through on off the record who only came on once and apparently harbor some bitterness from that time. <laughs> oh, now you remember. No, I don't harbor it at all, but people still bring no, it I'm up. Kidding around. I love that. I watched that segment and I thought, God, it's so funny. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, it just made me smile. <laughs> well, hey, it's funny because I was on a boat a couple of weeks ago with a guy, I'm now 47, he's 47, that bullied us when I was 13 years old. It was, it's been haunting me my whole life. He didn't even remember meeting me. He didn't even remember. And I'm like, I've been carrying this my whole life and you don't even remember it happening. Anyways, that. Yeah, that's same. pretty funny. On the radio, on the radio show a couple of days ago, uh, I was talking about. I, I don't know how it came up, but I asked um, the guys I was working with, Carlo in, in particular. I said, you know, have you ever been in a fight outside of on the ice? You know, outside of your uh, when you were trying to scratch Jason Spezza to death. Those those two guys who are buddies <laughs> had this fight. It's so funny. Not a lot of big blows landed. But I said to him, you know, like most normal people don't get into fights, right? Like, I don't know about you. When was the last time you you got into a fight where it was like, hey, I'm trying to hurt him. He's trying to hurt me. It's been a while. Yeah. So I made this <laughs> point. It was funny because I said, you know, I've been in a fight since I was in grade five. And it was Larry Kaufman who uh, I remember for some reason he took a an umbrella to school, which I thought was reason for me to make fun of him. And it even got better because he couldn't stick the umbrella in the ground. And we were going to fight and I, I, I gather I insulted him by insulting his umbrella and we never fought. And so we tracked him down and said, do you want to come on with Michael and talk about that? And he didn't recommend, didn't remember it. It's like, oh God, you know, maybe he's been in multiple scraps since then. But you know, for me, it was, you know, like, etched in my brain. It was a great moment. A major life moment. Exactly. Um, to, uh, to some actual sports, did you spend, I would assume, a lot of time on the Blue Jays on your show this morning? Uh, hey, they're, yeah. they're gone to the place. These young guys around here are acting like it's no big deal with our staff. I'm like, guys, we went 22 years between playoff appearances. This is a big deal. I, I assume you feel the same way. Uh, sure. I mean, let, let's face it. I mean, you're talking about our, you know, doing our jobs and being relevant and having things people that, you know, you, you think they want it, they want to hear or talk about and that, that they ha are emotionally invested. I mean, sports talk radio doesn't work if you're not emotionally invested. So the, this is great. I mean, whether it'll be over by, by Wednesday at eight o'clock, I don't know. Uh, that would be 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, six, are you guys two hours right now? Yes. Yeah, we're mountain. Yep. Yeah, I know that you guys are like, oh, we're so cool in Saskatchewan. We're going to not go on daylight savings or some bolt, whatever like that. And I can say that because Saskatoon, I, you, you've heard me say this before, is like my favorite city outside of... They love uh, you there. Outside of Toronto, probably. And why is that? There's a lot of Jewish people there? You know, I... I uh, I, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I could have fun with that comment. Um, I could make you feel like oh, no, did but I cross the line with that? Which hold on, hold on. You did not cross any lines, believe me. But I could make it. I, so this would be my response to that. If I if I was just being a jerk, uh, Rob. What, what do you mean by that? You think like I can only be comfortable with other Jewish people? No, you, you said you so came out here and met one Jewish person and it made you feel at home. I think it was in Regina. I think that happened. So I'm saying, is there more I in Saskatoon? Think, I think it yeah. may have happened in Regina. But Saskatoon, for me, um, well, first of all, because that's the home of Cameco. And yep. um, there's uh, a guy, Jonathan Huntington, at Cameco, who um, kind of sees the mental health world the way I see it and has, has really um, given us lots of exposure. He's hired us to do different things. Uh, we went out to North Battleford, Saskatchewan, to do an event that we wanted to do at their Civic Center two and a half years ago. And it was uh, basically because they had had three teenage suicides in a short period of time. And I called him up. I didn't know him anyone at, and you know in in saskatoon really other than him because i'd been at a charity event that cameco sponsored and i threw it out to him and he basically got back to me and said done we'll do the whole thing for you all you got to do is get guests and appear on stage 
And um, so from that standpoint, uh, he's my buddy. I've been out to Saskatoon to speak to Cameco and on their behalf, I don't know, half dozen times. I've probably been hired to give other speeches another half dozen times. So, you know, there's there's places in Toronto I've never been once, but I've been to Saskatoon probably 12 times. I know. Well, yeah, I don't know what it is because uh, I see the photos. Uh, you know, you spoke at Agribition not that long ago. Uh, certain mental health functions, obviously, the Cameco stuff. And Tim Gitzel, the CEO there, is just... Yes. And Jonathan's great, too. They take it very seriously, but that's just what we do in Saskatchewan. Jay and Dan are very big here, too. Like, you know, very I, big. Uh, I love the... Uh, I, I just... I, I feel like what's important to me is important to many of the people I've met. I, I mean, I, I don't want to sum up all of Saskatchewan and say that everyone thinks the same thing, but I've just felt like, you know, sometimes you go around talking about mental health and you feel like, oh, you know what? I don't think they really appreciate the importance of the message, which is fine. Right. You know, I'm not out there to, to convert people. Um, but I've always <laughs> felt kind of wanted and needed and felt like relevant in Saskatoon. Yeah, well, all of Saskatchewan, there's no doubt, because I, I know about those Regina events. Producer Clark has asked me your thoughts on the Stanley Cup final. I, doing morning radio, I can't imagine that you've been able to stay up for all these games. Uh, what's your take on the time starts and the games themselves? You know, uh, I actually have been, because the, the time starts have not been late, right? You know, well, let's go back in time to um, when games were in the afternoon, Oh my God, it was like the dream. I had so much fun watching the Raptors. You know, like uh, my family gathering in front of the TV at like three o'clock. Oh God, that was so awesome. And it was it was just everything about it I loved. But um, Stanley Cup, uh, most of the games, uh, you know, there hasn't been really anything um, since, I, I guess, since everything moved to Edmonton that's been later than an eight o'clock start, um, which, is, which is great. Uh, I, you know, I... I don't find myself grabbed by the Stanley Cup playoffs. I have to say, I I kind of think that um, I, I don't know what it is, but I, I'm not going to be disappointed when it's over. Having said that, uh, I mean I don't have a horse in this race, so to speak. I don't really care who wins. I've, I've kind of always liked Tampa just because I thought John Cooper did a really good job, you know, changing that franchise and turning it around. And then they were close and then they fell apart. And I like the way they've kind of rebuilt and come back, rebuilt mentally. So uh, those are just a bunch of random thoughts. I mean, the Leafs obviously were really disappointing and, you know, doing uh, being a Toronto guy and also doing morning radio in Toronto, you know, tends to uh, your opinion tends to be shaped by what local teams are doing and uh the Leafs kind of sucked yeah you're right well you do kind of have to dig a little deep for the storylines in the Stanley Cup final for sure I I'll agree with you there what is your prediction on the Blue Jays series by the way did you say a sweep by Tampa was that a what if or do you think that's actually going to happen yeah, no, that was a what if. I was saying yeah. you know you said it's pretty good and you know I said it's great you know it could be over <laughs> Wednesday um, I think the Jays will take it. To, uh, I think the Jays will take it to three. But you know, it's just there's no reason for that. Like I keep questioning people. We had Gord Ash on the show this morning, and we had uh, we had Buster Olney on all the time, and Steve Phillips. And you know, don't tell me that anything can happen. Right. Because anything that could be that could ruin every sports argument ever. Who do you think is going to win? Uh, well, you know, anything can happen. We know anything can happen. Right. That's not a shock. What usually happens is what should happen. So I'm going to say Tampa's going to win the series. I'm, I'm now convincing myself and I think they're going to win it in two. Wow. A sweep. But the Blue Jays are on the rise. Like, is this a sign of things to come or a blip? That would be a good question, too. You know, I, I think that if you just take this season, uh, the 60 games, and the fact that, um, you know, they were hovering around 500 for most of it, and they finished up over 500. Um, if you forget about the postseason, right, because this is artificial. Um, if you just look at it and you say, okay, well, you know, they played 60 games, and they won, what, 32 of those 60 games and lost 28? Well, eh, you know what? That's an improvement. So I'm going to take it as improvement. You know, they have to rebuild their pitching staff or continue to build their pitching staff. But the young talent 
is you, you can't not be excited by the young talent on this team. And they'll put up runs for sure, and they'll be fun to watch. So, yeah, I, I take this year as a success regardless of what happens with Tampa. Awesome. It will be a must-see TV event for sure. And, yeah, some people on the Shapiro-Atkins bandwagon. Michael, always good catching up. So proud to be on the same team with you. Uh, as you were, have a great day. You too. Um, thanks for having me. Hello to uh, to all of uh, all of my friends out there or out here, because I'm sure people can watch you uh, any place. And well, they should, Rod Peterson. You learned a lot that day on OTR. That's right. Next time we'll talk about OTR stories because I, I wanted to get into them and we're out of time here. But we would you would you Anytime. just by doing that? Uh, anytime, because I haven't left my house in six months, so I'm happy to do uh, anything, <laughs> anytime. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Michael. Michael Landsberg in Toronto joining us. So we didn't, like, I really wanted to get into those OTR stories. For, just to tee up, Michael, because he's probably still watching. Did you think it would grow into what it is? Did it change? I watched that As show. As it went along, because it didn't seem like it did in terms of the set. Every, it didn't need to change. Every day at 4.30, I mean, after school, I watched that show. And loved it. It was so great. Watch that. And that's when and then baseball would come on after or whatever. Um, it was awesome. I, I used to love it. You're watching Rod Peterson On Demand. For more of The Rod Peterson Show, visit rodpeterson.com or follow Rod Peterson on social media.